He's written 20 books, including his latest, No More National Debt, and three feature-length documentaries, including The Money Masters in 1995, one of the most watched films in internet history, and The Secret of Oz in 2010, winner of Best Documentary of 2010 at the uh, Beloit International Film Festival. In 2012, Bill still is running as a candidate for the Libertarian presidential ticket. Bill Still. Uh, so it's great to be here uh, speaking to an audience where the first reaction is not to tra thrash me within an inch of my life, <laughs> which is the reaction I usually have to work against speaking at Libertarian events because, of course, they're heavily involved with uh, Austrian economic theory and gold bugs and all that, so it's kind of like swimming upstream every time, but here I'm, I'm going with the flow, which is so much nicer. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I got to see uh, an entire day of speakers before I got out here because I went back to the hotel early, early yesterday because I knew I had to change my presentation. As a result, to be in the presence of Byron Dale and Ellen and Tom Greco, um, I've always, uh, whom I've always wanted to meet. I hope I can spend some more time with him. Uh, we just got to speak a couple minutes ago. Byron and I haven't been on the same stage in 10 years. Ellen and I haven't been on the same stage since Stockholm, I believe, about three years ago. Um, uh, let me tell you what this movement used to look like because. Um, probably a lot of you haven't been around yet as long as Byron and I have, um, and Ellen. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, this was the pre-9-11 truth time, uh, these conferences were all very patriotic events, pretty much focused on upholding constitutional values. America was the last bastion of freedom, etc., all things that I currently support. <laughs> I believe this nation is the best hope for changing this debt and money vulture system that hangs like a black cloud over humanity. Back in those days, there were only two monetary reformers out there, me and Byron. There was uh, some older gentleman who always manned a table at the back. I forget, do you remember his name, Byron? He always had Lindbergh's books and Wright Patman and all that. You know who I'm talking about, though? He was, he was the only other guy you know, who wasn't a hardcore gold bug. And I just want to tell you all, why, this, is, this is interesting that you don't know the history of it, but there's a reason why the monetary reform solution is not better known in this country. And that's the ascension of Austrian economic theory in the past 40 or 50 years. Byron's nodding his head. And that's, that's why the gold bugs are, have absolutely taken over the monetary reform discussion. And this is just a temporary and transient phenomenon. You know, the, the head of the whole gold bug theory is Ludwig von Mises. Well, you know who brought him from Austria? You know who paid for every, every day that he reigned as a professor of economics or whatever the heck his title was at New York University? The Rockefeller Foundation. That's why the gold answer is the false solution. And for the past 15 or 20 years, I've had this vision that we are going to come to a point where we see a serious economic downturn. We just saw a little one a little while ago. We're going to see a serious one. And at that point, the, the, the international-based, gold-backed money solution is going to be rolled out, and they're going to try to sell it to us. And all I've tried to do with my life in monetary reform is to is to head off, head them off at the pass at that crisis point, and have sufficient people aware that there's another alternative. Because it's going to come. And, okay, that's it. I'm gonna... <laughs> basically changed the focus 180 degrees. Suddenly America was the evil empire. We were a fascist nation. Uh, so suddenly instead of getting no press coverage at these conferences, 
suddenly Telemundo showed up, the Venezuelan news service. And of course, why do they show up? Because they just let it eat it up that America's a bad place. And so therefore, our system must, you know, the, the Venezuelan, the communist, the whatever system is a better thing to try. That's what they're all about. And that's, that's what I don't support. And so uh, after hearing so many people talk yesterday, especially that young lady that got up here, not to mention the Canadian guy, and it was like they were saying stuff that has come out of my mouth for the past 10 years. It felt great, like I can finally go away and they can take over. I think we should encase that young lady in a plexiglass bubble and just feed her and give her an internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> and she can just take over. She's already a lot better spoken than I am. at this. I can't just go off the top of my head. I've got to read this stuff. Otherwise, I'll forget what my name is. Um, well, I'm, I'm always very optimistic. I, I've, I've had tried to live my writing career by two standards that are important. I've never written a word that I wouldn't want any of my four children to read. And number two, and most importantly, I've never written a word that gives a hopeless message. There are, there are two, these are the two worst things that we can do as writers. Our, children's are, our children are the ones who we must inspire to greatness and goodness, or all of our efforts to <clears throat> monetary reform will be gone when we die. And secondly, and most importantly, a hopeless message is the worst possible thing that we can do. Worse than offering the gold standard as a viable solution. Why? Because if people think there is no hope, they will not fight. They will not come to these conferences. You can't inspire a hopeless message. And that's another thing I have against the whole 9-11 truth, folks. I know it's not popular, but I don't care. So I, I know I'm going to offend some people with this knocking the 9-11 truthers, but I'm way used to taking unpopular stands. I just know the results. Instead of bumping along with almost zero media coverage, suddenly we had coverage when they, they came in the picture. And there's a, a very famous uh, clip on the internet where I said, I'm not coming to another one of these conferences until these people go away. Monetary reform is an exception. <laughs> Ellen's conferences are an exception. So, uh, uh, let's see. You know, everyone in this room uh, believes that the most important power of a sovereign is the money power. All we have to do is take that back in the hands of we the people, however that plays out. So um, uh, that's, that's my sermon, and I should probably sit down at this point, but I do have more time, so I'm going to use it up. Um, so uh, before I get going, I just want to throw in some bits and pieces that are kind of off the theme, but... It all kind of weaves together, and you'll, you'll see how it all, all fits together, uh, back to the theme of beyond right and left. And these are the things that I'm going to cover. This is just welcome to my world. These are the things that cross my desk that I have to try to put time into. And, uh, you know, I don't have a staff. I'm just me. So I've been working on this monetary reform concept a long time, like 30 years. Uh, about 17 years ago, I produced The Money Masters, which consistently ranks in the top 25 most watched films on the internet. So, uh, has it held up? Let's take a quick look back in time when Bill was only 40 years old. What's going on in America? on the steps of the Federal Reserve System now. I had to show my driver's license about six months ago, the last time I filmed there, just to stand on the sidewalk in front of it. So, time to the Byron's laughing back there. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, Naomi Prince, a former director at Goldman Sachs, described the Money Masters in Sinista Magazine as, quote, doing a superb job of revealing the truth behind the Fed and the powerful global financiers whose self-interest has dictated our banking system from the beginning. Okay, so much for self-congratulatory stuff. Well, no, there's still some more self-congratulatory stuff. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, now let's take a, a look at, uh, at this guy. Uh, Ron Paul is one of the primary problems for us monetary reformers. One of the main reasons that everybody is still so confused. Now I like Dr. Paul. For years he's been the voice of anti-Fed forces, but where he goes astray is the solution, the gold solution. 
we all agree that the problem is that the quantity of money is out of control. Dr. Paul thinks gold is going to fix this. Now, this is my axiom on that topic. It matters not what backs the money. All that matters is who controls the quantity. We've been on a gold-backed money system. We were on a gold-backed money system during the Great Depression. Didn't do a thing for us. All that matters is who is in control. We, the people, have to take back control of the money system or we're never going to get anywhere. And it just makes sense. I mean, do, do you want the greatest power of a sovereign nation in the control of an unelectable banker? Or do you want it in control of somebody who's elected one way or another? I don't care how it happens, just so it's out of their hands and somehow closer to being in our hands. I don't have all the solutions. I don't pretend to. Okay, so uh, uh, as I say in my oh yeah, let, let's have let's hear from uh, Dr. Paul. A little delay. I didn't edit it. I don't like the idea that they have monopoly control. It's a cartel. They get to print the money, and uh, the Constitution really doesn't give them that authority. The Constitution said that only gold and silver can be legal tender. Uh. That drives me crazy when he says only gold and silver can be legal tender according to the Constitution. Where does it say that on? Okay, as I say in my book, just how many incorrect statements can you make in 12 seconds? <laughs> so for the past 40 years, I disagree with Hazel Henderson. Ron Paul is not a good thing for this country. I'm sorry. Uh, so for the past 40 years or so, the gold bugs have completely dominated the talk of true monetary reform and been able to successfully pigeonhole the greenbacker solution as nothing but wild money printing. If we're not going to control the quantity, why would we even be here? That's the whole point, to have a stable economic system. That's the very definition of, of, of economic study anyway, to create stability. That's what we're trying to do. But the gold bug ascension to power is starting to wane now. And that's why I went directly into the heart of the beast on this worthless quest. Uh, I shouldn't say worthless quest because it's being recorded. <laughs> In any case. <laughs> so, the Libertarian Party is America's third largest political party. The one place where the gold bug political activists are the most firmly entrenched. My mission to begin to plant was to begin to plant some seeds of truth, and it's been pretty effective. Now, I'm not going to win the Libertarian Party's presidential nomination one week from today at their national convention, but I did way better than I expected to. I've consistently come in second in most every state's straw polls where I've been uh, in the presidential debates. Um, so, so, and, so who is going to win? This is the guy that's going to win. Uh, former governor of New Mexico, Gary Johnson. He was a failed Republican candidate before he suddenly dropped out of the Republican uh, race on December 28th and announced that he had really actually been a lifelong libertarian <laughs> and brought his $250,000 worth of debt, which he'd accumulated in the Republican race over to the Libertarian Party, something they're completely against, but somehow they've ignored that. Um, so is he an improvement over the Democrats and Republicans from a monetary reform perspective? Uh, that's his face there on the right. You can't quite see it, but this is campaign material that he put out. <laughs> and he thinks he's some sort of political messiah, and you're about to see exactly how smart this messiah is. Uh, here's a recording of a radio appearance he made at a Georgia radio station just two months ago. Unfortunately for him, my appearance occurred two hours after his, and the host said, boy, that guy said some really crazy stuff and gave me the tape. Uh, <laughs> uh, followed by a video of some, uh, uh, just a brilliant statement he made at the Florida Libertarian uh, debate, followed by uh, my response, and you can see why I'm not going to win. Okay, let's see if we can get this baby up. It's one thing to borrow money, which is an okay phenomenon. It's another thing to print money. Borrowing is okay. Printing money, that's what we need to stop. Yes, sir. That's my mantra. We own the Federal Reserve. There's a misconception that the Federal Reserve is some private entity. But if I might, uh, if I might give an analogy here, we own all, we, U.S. taxpayers, we own all the stock in the Federal Reserve. Surprise! We <laughs> of those on Wall Street. You know what? It's probably because... Oh, 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 oh. Bad Bill. <laughs> it's one thing to borrow money. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. We 
own all, we, U.S. taxpayers, we own all the stock in the Federal Reserve. I'm asked, what about uh, criminal prosecution of those on Wall Street? You know what, it's probably because none of them committed any crimes, 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 they just made some incredibly bad decisions.
now let's look at clause number two. I've got it highlighted in blue there. To borrow money on the credit of the United States. This is the only thing I have against the Constitution, and hey, guess what? I'm in pretty good company. Uh, to Thomas Jefferson, Clause 2 was the biggest, if not the only, defect he saw in the Constitution. I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution. I would be willing to depend on that alone for the reduction of the administration of our government. I mean an additional article taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. And consider this. If the federal government could not borrow, they would automatically have to balance their budget. Because if they spent more than their income, Congress would have to feel the wrath of the voting electorate immediately because they'd have to raise taxes to pay for the spending immediately. Okay, the second biggest confuser on this topic is the current term coin money. To the gold bugs or metalists, uh, this means metallic coins only should be authorized. I also noticed that, that I included the next clause uh, to provide for punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. Oh, 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 what about those fractional reserve lending guys? So let's uh, move on here. Um, in, in a lengthy but definitive paper in 2008, Professor Robert Nadelson of Harvard explained the meaning of this, the coinage clause, as follows. Coin, even in monetarist Britain, meant payment of any kind. The verb to coin could mean to make or forge anything, represented today by the common expression to coin a phrase. So, pursuant to the usage, paper money could be coined. But the Supreme Court has ruled as well on the acceptability of paper money under the coinage clause several times. In 1870, Hepburn versus uh, Griswold, 71, Knox versus Lee, uh, Knox versus Lee was upheld in court challenges in 1872, and also the famous and final Juilliard versus Greenman case in 1884, which caused Professor Murray Rothbard, the king of the gold bugs in academia, to say, from then on, paper money would be held consonant with the U.S. Constitution. It's settled law now. It's not even a debate. Okay, so here's a famous Jackson quote, which unless you understand the difficulties of the definition of coin, money, this quote is difficult to understand. If Congress has the right under the Constitution to issue paper money, it was given to them to be used by themselves, not to be delegated to individuals or corporations. Truer words were never spoken. However, um, so in this case, there's been, uh, it's been my argument in the past, and it's been pretty effective, but just this week, a superb new nugget of information has been added to my armamentarium by Scott Baker, the public banking head for New York. And Scott, could you raise your hands? Everybody knows who in the heck you are? He, uh, this, is, this is just great. This helps things so much. Uh, Scott sent me this, this uh, commentary on why the framers worded the Constitution this way. On August 16, 1787, the framers' final vote on, on money powers delisted paper money, lest it excite the opposition of the monopoly bent moneyed interests. And to be, and be used to exploit a general paper money phobia so as not to altogether exclude it. Before voting, Madison obtained firm commitment that the delisting did not disable the government from the use of public notes as far as they could be safe and proper. Public notes, guys, don't you love that the phrase? It just cuts to the heart of what's going on. In other words, here we see that Madison had to compromise with the money masters of his day in order to get the Constitution passed. The intent is clear to those who study these things at length, but easy to obfuscate by those determined to muddy the waters. So this is the first time that I've been able to appreciate the pressures Madison and the other founders faced on the money power. Now let's look at what Dr. Paul is confused about. Article 1, Section 10. Uh, coin money amid bills of credit. Make anything but gold or silver coin a tender in payment of debts. This is what, this is what Dr. Paul interprets to mean that only gold and silver can be legal tender. That is such a crude, in my view, and desperately deceptive interpretation of the Constitution that it completely mars Dr. Paul's reputation in history going forward. He completely ignores that this is a prohibition for the states alone. The problem this tried to remedy was that state banks were issuing their own fiat banknotes without any sort of regulation. No one in Virginia knew the value of state bank notes from New Hampshire. The idea was to federalize money in an effort to regulate the value thereof. And besides, has any state ever, ever paid its debts in gold or silver coin alone? Dr. Paul and his followers should hang their heads in shame for this deliberate misquoting of the Constitution. 
Another interesting item Scott Baker sent me was this impressive petition, which all of you should consider signing, called uh, for calling for Congress to reissue debt-free notes. I do have one problem with the wording, however, and uh, the, the favorable mention of the Kucinich and Conyers bill, the Need Act, H.R. 2990. Other than that, it looks, uh, looks to be something good that we all should be supporting. And of course, that's very minor. Now I want to go into this Kucinich bill. Uh, it does advocate the use of greenbacks, debt-free government-issued money in the public interest. However, the bill has some severe flaws. In this bill, the monetary authority, the body which, uh, which has within its authority levers of power, which the Fed currently has to control the quantity of money, is way not democratic enough. Power is way too consolidated. This is the most important power of a sovereign nation that must be deconsolidated to the maximum extent that's politically practical. Here is the act. In section 302, it states that the monetary authority will be under the Secretary of Treasury. My comments are in blue. Uh, is anybody comfortable with this, uh, being under the Secretary of, of Treasury? I'm certainly not. Even despite the subsequent enhancements in sections B and C, and this is the Kucinich Act, remember, trying to be more specific, I'm completely uncomfortable with this. This is a power choke point uh, in this bill that is completely a completely unnecessary overconsolidation of power. The second problem is the composition of the monetary authority. Nine members appointed by, appointed by the president to staggered terms. This is exactly how the Federal Reserve Board of Governors is constituted and makes them completely non-democratically selected by the president. And the president even designates the chairperson. Again, my comments are in blue. This is all right out of my book. Uh, but I look, look forward to talking to people about this uh, later today. Now here's the way this should go. Since this monetary authority is only authorized by implication in Article 1, Section 8, regulate the value thereof clause, the actual way that this should be accomplished would be to default back to the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. And for those who don't remember it, like me, until I got into this, uh, this is what it says. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The monetary authority should be completely independent and composed of members from each of the 50 states. Maximum deconsolidation of power. And it should not be beholden to the Secretary of Treasury. It should only be responsible and accountable to the individual state legislatures via their duly elected or appointed representatives. Okay, this is uh, another thing uh, uh, that was sent to me. Uh, this is a, a lawsuit filed by Cliff Johnson of California, filed in federal court in California. Uh, and in it, he asks that a few hundred billion, not a trivial amount, trivial amount, of U.S. notes be used to make Social Security payments, thus retiring that amount of debt. His lawsuit also contends that misleading statements about the effectiveness of U.S. notes on Treasury's website are making it difficult for him to pursue his case. So here's an interesting discussion between the judge, Judge Alsop, the plaintiff, Mr. Johnson, and Treasury's attorney, Mr. Perlman. Judge Alsop, why don't you stand on a street corner and tell passers-by you're trying what you're trying to do here? Johnson, I do. Judge Alsop, surprised. Then what's the problem with that? I can't get through. No one knows there's any difference between U.S. notes and Federal Reserve notes because the Treasury says there's no difference. And that's a misrepresentation of simple fact. And it's an intentional authoritarian misrepresentation. It distorts the public debate. Uh, and this is the uh, defense attorney, or the, the, the government's attorney. Uh, we're going to file a motion to dismiss on Monday, Your Honor. And then Johnson says, I should add that there's an amendment I need to make. It's an election issue. The libertarian candidate, Bill Still, has expressed support for this case. Libertarians have a greenback platform. Not exactly true, but uh, which is what the case is about. So should I amend this? Uh, uh, as an election issue, maybe cite the candidate as a non-interested party. On hearing this, the libertarian, uh, that the libertarian candidate had expressed interest in the case, Al Sapp's eyebrows raised and he suddenly got professional. Johnson said that he believes the judge would have dismissed the case without my name having been brought into the suit, so perhaps uh, this has done some good. Okay, now let's look at tungsten and gold bars. Uh, for years, a story and many different flavors of it was circulated on the internet, but a couple of weeks ago came the first visual proof that it was true. It's probably the biggest slap in the face for the gold bugs imaginable. Metalists have always argued that gold is a reliable store of value and free from the ability of the money masters to manipulate the quantity. But check this out. So here's a perfectly good picture of a one kilogram uh, gold bar, which you can't see very well. And here's the top half of it. It's been cut in half. 
And then here's the side view, uh, clearly showing, can you see them? Uh, that 40% of the weight is taken up by uh, tungsten rods. The gold bar was bored and the tungsten rods were pressed into one end. Tungsten is an ideal substitution for gold because the densities are remarkably similar. The problem is that who in their right mind would want to cut into their one kilogram gold bar to discover that it's actually a fake and therefore worth 40% less than they paid for it? The implications of this are huge. It's, it's just so great to be a monetary reformer at these times. <laughs> okay, um, now here's another, uh, for every gem I get, of course, uh, there's a hundred false trails. And this is one you probably heard of. I'm almost to the end, it's okay. Um, like this one from the Drudge Report, it says that Iceland is making plans to forgive mortgage debt for all of its citizens. So how many people have heard about this? A lot of people, it's just completely bogus, I'm sorry. Um, so I, I checked this with my friend uh, in the Icelandic parliament, Brigitte Jones' daughter. Uh, Brigitte is the lady who's in my film, The Secret of Oz, and it, this just reminds you who she is. Why are governments pumping money into private banks? Why are they not letting them roll? I mean, just like any other. And then the excuse is, oh, they're too big to fail. <laughs> Let them fail, please. Isn't it wonderful how this is just like universal truth? <laughs> okay, so here's her email back to me. Dear Bill, I'm sorry to say that this must be some sort of joke. I'm gathering facts uh, versus fiction in order to respond to this and we'll post it on my blog this week. Now remember, this Brigitte is the leader of the anti-IMF forces in Iceland. The leader of the Icelandic protest movement, which goes out and surrounds people's houses who are about to be foreclosed on with human chains. And this has stopped foreclosures in the past. She would certainly know it, that, that this was the truth. Um, this is the person to go to. Uh, but then she says something else very interesting. I'm on my way to Canada later today, still not able to travel to your country. So what the heck is this all about? Brigitte is suing the U.S. government to prevent the implementation of the draconian provisions of the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. When I first heard of this, you know, when I first heard of this, I just thought it wasn't true. I thought it couldn't be true. How, how could they possibly do that? And so I just ignored it for the first month. But eventually, oh, this is true? And why haven't they, why haven't they had a special session of Congress just to repeal the doggone thing? Why haven't they? I don't get it. So the, to go on with Candida's comments, I felt under direct threat when NDAA was passed, I've not been able to travel to the U.S. for more than a year under advice from the Icelandic State Department. Basically, what the NDAA means is that the U.S. military can put anyone anywhere under suspicion of being a terror threat or an associate and detain you forever without ever having access to a lawyer or a court. Us too. I know. But she, Anyone. It's even more scary if you're from, not from the United States. I mean, you know, all your family's back in another place. So that begins us with the NDAA. This week, the NDAA nullification law finally took effect in Virginia. Yes. Yes. After a three-month battle, the law, quote, prevents any agency, political subdivision, employee, or member of the military of Virginia from assisting an agency of the armed forces of the United States in the conduct of the investigation, prosecution, or detention of a United States citizen in violation of the U.S. Constitution, Constitution of Virginia, or any Virginia law or regulation. The bill was passed with an unprecedented, overwhelming vote of 80, 89 to 7 in the House and 36 to 1 in the Senate, and then the governor drug his feet for two months, not unwilling to sign it because he's on some Obama commission. And he's a, the most conservative of Republicans. This was led by the hero of this thing is Bob Marshall. I know him, I've known him for a long time. We refer to him as Virginia's greatest living legislator. He's a conservative Republican. He's just, he's right on everything. That's all I can say. During the 2010 legislative session, Marshall stunned the nation by something else that's more along our lines, by proposing a study commission, I think it was the very first uh, state to do this, to study the feasibility of a state-owned, state-chartered bank, the Bank of Virginia, along the lines of the Bank of North Dakota. The measure was tabled, but this year Marshall introduced it again, this time it's named H.R. 12, and that's it. Unfortunately, a subcommittee called the House Assigned Rules Subcommittee tabled the bill again, killing it for this year. 
uh, Marshall, incidentally, is seeking the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate Virginia this year, running uh, in the Republican primary against former Senator George Allen. So now my uh, time is up, and, but I'm still going to go on just another minute. <laughs> So now I'm finally getting to the main, <laughs> those are just bits and pieces, now, now we're getting the main thing. So now it's time for me to get on my presentation. Monetary reform rests on two great pillars that are I refer to as inviolable. In other words, you have to have this to make it work. Uh, no more national debt and ending the Federal Reserve System. Uh, public banking is a great adjunct to these because it deconsolidates the money power by pushing it down to the states as per the Tenth Amendment. When in doubt about anything in this arena, I always go back to voting for deconsolidation of power. You'll never see people rioting in the streets, oh, the government doesn't have enough power. No, it's always the other way around. So this is how big this $500 billion interest on the debt figure is. Ellen, I believe, quoted $440 billion. I, I, uh, I think the CBO uh, just said in this FY, we're going to see $540 billion in interest payments on the national debt alone. How big is that number? We only spend $19 billion on all of NASA, $7 billion on the National Science Foundation, $20 billion on the CIA, just these listed, that's only $160 billion. And yet we're paying $500 billion a year in interest on the national debt, something that is entirely unnecessary. Okay. This, this $500 billion, that's, that's equal to the entire discretionary budget of Congress. This is how big that number is. And now, according to the CBO, in 2020, that will exceed a trillion dollars a year, just interest on the national debt alone, something that is entirely unnecessary. Okay, so the national debt equals loss of democratic control. The borrower is servant to the lender, according uh, to Proverbs. Yesterday, we heard several presenters call this autocracy, but, you know, there, there's really a better word for it, and that word is plutocracy, yeah. ruled by the rich. That this is what the entire last thousand year march of humankind has been all about. How to create political systems that will allow the majority to escape serfdom. That's what this has been all about. The Magna Carta, the Charter of Liberties before that, uh, right down to the U.S. Constitution. We are rapidly devolving back into this plutocratic state, and no matter what your political perspective is, everyone worldwide senses this. They just, they're completely confused about what to do about it. You know, if you had an, a, a, an illegal enterprise, a fraudulent enterprise, that, that raked in multi-trillions of dollars per year, you could afford to spend a couple of billion dollars on PR just to keep people confused. And that's exactly what's going on. <laughs> the mainline libertarian position, which just drives me nuts, is, is that government is too corrupt to fix the problem. Half the Libertarian Party are these anarchists. You know, they think a oh, government just won't work. And I go, yo, we've got a political party, and you're going to have national conventions and try to elect present candidates, but you don't believe in government. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's just they've got no place else to go, so they went to the Libertarian Party. Um, <laughs> they're never going to let me back into a convention. <laughs> But anyway, I say government is all we've got. It's the only thing by corporately banding together, we the little people can possibly, through the rule of law, fight uh, successfully against the money masters and continue this path uh, towards freedom and away from serfdom. That's what this is all about. Uh, this is probably my favorite quote. This is Gouverneur Morris, one of the main uh, 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 writers of, of the Constitution, it, it really hits the nail exactly on the head uh, on the relationship between us, the little guys, and them, the rich people. The rich will strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest. They always did, they always will. They will have the same effect here as elsewhere if we do not, by the power of government, keep them in their proper spheres.